The This Week in Startups, the Power of Accelerators series is brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. A business is only as strong as its people and every hire matters. Go to linkedin.com slash power and get a $50 credit towards your first job post. And Embroker. The Embroker Startup Insurance Program helps startups secure the most important types of insurance at a lower cost and with less hassle. Save up to 20% off of traditional insurance today at Embroker.com slash twist. While you're there, get an extra 10% off using offer code ANGEL10. Hey everybody, welcome to This Week in Startups. We're doing a special series, The Power of Accelerators. What's an accelerator or an incubator? You may have heard of these things before if you're new to the startup scene. It's typically a 12 or 16 week program. Sometimes you do it 100% in person. Sometimes it's 100% virtual. Most of the time you make one or two visits a week into a space with a bunch of people who are investors and maybe even advisors or mentors, and they help you accelerate the process of starting a company. So why would anybody do this? Well, most of the accelerators out there in the world give you a little bit of money, somewhere between $25,000 and $150,000 for a little bit of equity, somewhere between five, six, seven percent typically. I've seen some do 10%, some of them do one or two percent. And they're all over the world. In the 90s, we had incubators. Incubators were slightly different. Usually it was one person or a team that came up with ideas and then matched management teams to ideas. It never really worked with the exception of a, an incubator called Idea Lab, uh, but we'll leave that for another episode. And then Y Combinator and Techstar started over 10 years ago. They each graduate 400 startups a year. They each put in 125 or 150,000 for six or seven percent. And a lot of times this is looked at as going to graduate school or college for venture capitalists and downstream investors. They look at what's coming out of the accelerators and incubators and take meetings. In other words, It's just like a career fair at Stanford or Harvard or MIT. The companies that are looking for talent to develop over the years to make investment in will look at those places as people who sort through talent and sharpen talent. That's the role of incubators and accelerators. So if you're a fifth-time entrepreneur, probably no need to go. You can fund your project yourself. You can fund the building of your team, uh, and you don't need a bunch of blocking and tackling advice. We have one. It's called the Launch Accelerator. Uh, You've heard of Y Combinator. You've heard of Techstars. You may not have heard of today's accelerator. That's because they operate in China uh, and some other places. And they're called SOSV. Uh, And they are a um, global accelerator. uh, And the managing general partner, Sean O'Sullivan, and he's with us today from Princeton, New Jersey. Uh, This is being taped during the coronavirus quarantine. So, Sean, uh, I I hope everybody is safe and sound with you. Well, uh, most people are safe and sound uh, at at home. Uh, We have a couple of people that have been affected mostly in our startups uh, by, uh, you know, being hospitalized or or, uh, you know, getting through it. No one. No one. So you've had people in your portfolio, business partners who have uh, come down with it and been hospitalized. Yeah, my one of my partners, um, uh, Brad Higgins, uh, he was a partner with us in SOSV1. He's a little older and he's in his 60s and he was hospitalized. Um, he's in uh, Westchester, or no, he's in Connecticut, uh, you know, just in the New York City area. And he was um, in the ICU, but he's been just released the last two days. So he's uh, looking good. Well, that's it's, fantastic. Yeah. Um, and you've operated in China. Uh, what's the... Has there well, about half about half of our staff is in China. Yeah. Actually, how have they uh, been impacted, and what's the um, what's the well, of course, yeah, what's the feedback yeah, there? Yeah, uh, the uh, of course it's much less uh, of an issue in China uh, than in the U.S. because they had ten times less people infected, uh, you know, by this uh, by the coronavirus. But um, they do, uh, you know, they do see. Uh, you know, a huge uh, lockdown on their capabilities uh, to work uh, and to move around. And that continues even many months past the the peak. The apex there was, uh, you know, back in late, was it late January? Uh, or, or is it very first week or two of February? I can't remember. 
but uh, you know, months later, they're still really locked down. And that's one of the things I think in the U.S. we're we're not yet uh, aware of how much longer we're going to be locked down. Yeah. Um, well, I'm glad your partner's okay, and it seems like we're getting through it slowly but shortly. Surely, um, tell me a little bit about the accelerator. You graduated your first class in China in 2010. I know you've been going to China since the 80s or 90s working on software companies. Uh, mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about the origin of the SOSV. Am I pronouncing it correctly? SOSV? Yeah. SOSV, that's the name of the venture capital firm. Got it. Uh, and then we have uh, accelerator uh, different accelerator families all underneath the SOSV family. So, What does SOSV uh, stand for? It doesn't really stand for anything. It used to be uh, SOS Ventures. My initials are SOS. Uh, and it was, I started, uh, Jason, I think in a similar way to you as a sort of a super angel, you know, investing in checks of 50 or 100 or $500,000 checks into startups after my first company went public. Uh, and then I then progressed to uh, creating this, uh, you know, copying effectively the accelerator model. Um, I do date it all the way back to the idea lab, uh, you know, sort of as a as the grandfather of all, of all, the, all these accelerators. But uh, the model that we were sort of modeled after was uh, more the Techstars model, where you have a cohort of people in a, in a community that is working together, right, uh, in one physical space, um, and, you know, and, and you know, so people So explain that in decision, because Y Combinator's always been very firm about, hey, we're not going to house everybody. We think that that slows them down. It creates this like social dynamic, uh, and that's not good. We want people to go back to work uh, and stay home. Yeah. And then you've chosen, Techstars has chosen in some cases, to have everybody in a co-working space where, and the argument is, they can flourish, talk to each other, and that socialization doesn't result in distraction. It results in collaboration and learning. Uh, that's right. One, what, yeah, the how do you execute yeah. this without, and what do you think of Y Combinator's uh, position on this? Well, I mean, it's certainly economically very easy for them to make that decision. And I think that's a, you know, it's a, it's a much less costly way of doing business, especially if you're doing anything like what we do as well. I mean, you know, for, for what we do at SOSV, we run the world's largest and most successful hardware accelerators, life science accelerators, and, uh, you know, you know, disruptive uh, sort of food accelerators. And, and in China and in Asia, we run the, the software accelerators, the most popular software accelerators in, in Asia. So, uh, but in, in terms of the verticals that we concentrate on, the actual physical need is quite concrete. You know, you're, if you have a life sciences accelerator, it makes perfect sense to be sharing that lab space as well as uh, just- Got it. So to there's some shared resourcing that's different in terms of life science or hardware uh, where you might need fabrication machines and Y Combinator doesn't Prototyping. have to pay for if they have 200 plus companies per cohort and you had two or three desks each, you're talking about 500, 600 desk facility at a 150 square feet a person. I mean, this becomes a ginormous space. Yeah. So, so, I mean, they can basically have their events as they do. It's kind of like a banquet hall. They have, I guess, a Wednesday night dinner or something. They have some super famous person comes in, gives a speech, but it's not that same sense of community that you'd get if it's a 40 or 50 person sort of uh, cohort that's all working together uh, with some help, uh, you know, with, with the, all the mentors and the SOSV has a very different model uh, than most accelerators because we do like, you know, we have electrical engineers. If it's a hardware thing, we have electrical engineers and and design for manufacturing engineers and, you know, supply So let's start with that. People. What are the verticals that you are focused on? The two biggest ones are life sciences and hardware. And those both require specific hardware to be available. What's the standard deal? Is there a standard deal? You put 100,000 in for five, 6%? Well, actually, it's it was interesting when you said that. Like most of the deals, like if you look at... Uh, some of the popular deals, there's they get five or six percent for the common for the what's considered their sort of um, you know their uh, intellectual contribution or the networking capabilities or their fundraising capabilities, and then they get a say that hundred thousand dollar or hundred fifty thousand dollar note is a convertible note, which then uh, converts at whatever the CLN then converts to later. So if you look at you know, some a popular deal would be say like uh, six percent for common, and then one a uh, hundred thousand dollars at a 
at a, at a presumed 10 million cap. If you end up raising it at 3 million cap, then that becomes whatever, 3%. So actually, even that 6% is not really a 7% deal, which is the 7% deal that you hear about is presuming that all of the startups that come out will get a $10 million uh, valuation, which which they never really did. Uh, but you know there was always the prospect that you would. Uh, so that's that's why they they said that because the safe or whatever was 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 set at a ten million uh, cap theoretically. But then when you actually get funded, it ends up turning out to be a little bit more than that. So yeah, so we have a, a traditionally you know a six percent sort of common, and then we have a, a a note just like the others do. But the note is a little bit more, um, and so we give the the companies uh, typically in the hardware space we give them two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Um, and then we give in the life sciences a similar similar amount. Another difference, I guess, is that we also are very active in following on with our companies. And so it's very, very typical for us to just put the, the first check is actually only about 25% of the capital that we deploy into all of our accelerated companies. So we save most of the money uh, for follow on checks, which range from a couple hundred thousand to a million and a half or even $2 million. How many companies do you have in a cohort and how many cohorts do you run a year for each of those uh, accelerated we, programs? It's great. So we, we run effectively 15 cohorts a year, 10 companies in a cohort. We find the smaller size enables the community to really engage with each other and they become lifelong resources to each other. I mean, obviously there's a larger benefit effect of being in the Hacks hardware community because there's all the different factories, hundreds of factories and, and whatnot that we work with and the suppliers and the supply chain issues, et cetera. But, and that, that goes sort of crosses the span of, of all the cohorts. But uh, the, the biggest uh, relationships that people will rely on for the rest of their lives are the 40 other, 50 other people that are working together and really are going through the same struggles and the same, uh, the same sort of uh, dynamics of raising the first rounds, you know, you know, getting their first uh, commercial deals, working with five, Fortune 500 companies. And that group of people is a built in sort of peer consulting network. And I'm sure you find the same with uh, your accelerator. All right, when we get back from this quick break, I want to understand the criteria, the Goldilocks zone, as we like to call it internally. What's the perfect stage of a startup to join uh, your accelerators at SOSV? Uh, when we get back on This Week in Startups, our special Power of Accelerator series. Now more than ever, we need people with the right skills to support our communities, especially the frontline workers who provide resources and care for those most in need. To help, LinkedIn is offering free job posts for healthcare and essential service organizations that need to quickly fill critical roles with the people who help us all. How amazing is that? If you're hiring for one of these organizations, LinkedIn's active community of over 679 million members, unbelievable how big it's gotten, can help you find the right people for the frontline fast. LinkedIn Jobs screens candidates for the skills and experience you're looking for, and it puts your job post in front of qualified people who meet your requirements. So you can find the right person and you can fill critical roles quickly and properly with a talented person. Here's an example. Takeoffs.io is one of the companies we invested in, and they build an AI-enabled building materials marketplace. It's a really cool product, and last year, their CEO, Chris, was trying to hire an AI, artificial intelligence engineer lead, which is really difficult. There's a lot of competition for these, and it's a very unique skill set. Well, he used LinkedIn Jobs to find a perfect candidate after hearing about it here on This Week in Startups. And he got a candidate with a PhD in computer vision, and that employee has been with them for over a year, and he has rolled out several major projects. So here is your CTA, the old call to action. When it's time to hire and find the right person, LinkedIn is there to help. Plus, if you need to hire for healthcare or essential services, you can post your job for free. That's awesome, LinkedIn. Go to linkedin.com slash power for $50 off your first job post. That's right, linkedin.com slash power, because this is the Power of Accelerator series. Again, linkedin.com slash power. Terms and conditions, of course, apply because they're giving you 50 bucks. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. All right, Sean O'Sullivan is with us. He is the founder and managing general partner of SOSV. Get it, Sean O'Sullivan uh, Ventures. And he has a number of different accelerators. One is called Food X, and the other one is called Hacks, uh, the hardware accelerator, and Food X. Where can people find these on the web? Uh, they can find everything under SOSV.com. Uh, SOSV.com, nice four-letter domain. Yeah. 
Yeah. And they can also go to the individual accelerators like hacks.co or indiebio.co. Indiebio.co is the is the biotech one. Life sciences. Yeah. Life sciences one. And so uh, what is the stage of company you're looking for? Are you looking for people with ideas, business plans, prototypes, products in market, customers? Uh, what's the scale here? Yeah, it's it actually varies uh, by the accelerator. So in food, uh, generally, uh, we have companies that already have the prototypes and perhaps are even shipping into uh, into the marketplace. Uh, but in the you know in into grocery chains and things like that, if they're an actual food uh, company, if they're a food technology company, they they would be at a little earlier stage where uh, maybe they just have a prototype or a few customers but need to scale. Um, and then, and then for the um, hardware accelerators, we would expect them to have prototypes of working devices, but we'd expect them to be at a point where they'll their industrial design isn't done, their their works like may not really be fully done. But, and their so they're looks not like, even at Kickstarter level yet. They ha don't even have. Oh a no, prototype. definitely not. Definitely As a matter not. of fact, actually, for our teams, we have uh, we have had more teams uh, that have. Uh, gone through Kickstarter than any other accelerator program in the world. I think 8% of all the Kickstarter projects um, uh, of all time that grossed more than a million dollars came out of the Hacks program by itself. Wow. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it's been a super successful way of non-dilutive funding for our consumer uh, companies. And then what about, f so that's FoodX and Hacks. And then the third one is? IndieBio is, Indie the, yeah. is the life sciences one. And so IndieBio is, uh, you know, doing a lot of work now with the COVID-19 uh, crisis in, uh, you know, a whole bunch of different solutions, testing solutions, rapid diagnostics, um, antibody uh, treatments, um, and uh, vaccines, et cetera. Um, so we have a, probably two dozen companies, not just IndieBio companies, but uh, two dozen or so uh, companies that are, uh, you know, very, very active in this period trying to put down the virus. Um, but the the other uh, you know the the main thing that IndieBio has been famous for uh, you know to date uh, you know is uh, for example all the the cellular agriculture industry uh, companies like Memphis Meats or Perfect Day or uh, Geltor these are companies that are receiving rounds of hundreds of millions of dollars uh, Memphis Meats just closed on one hundred and seventy five million dollars I think it was in the last uh, quarter uh, of capital uh, as they expand their um, meat uh, without animals, but it is animal meat. It's just grown in bioreactors. Um, and the same thing with Perfect Day, producing milk without cows, using that for ice cream and, and uh, other things. But again, not like a nut milk or a soy milk or anything, actually cow milk, but without the cow, that, those kinds of things. So let, let's talk about food for a second. I think it's a great jumping off point. Um, Memphis Meats is one of the companies making mock meat or meat, I guess there's two different categories here. You have meat that's made from plants and then meats that's made in a bioreactor. Explain yeah, for so a lay it, person what's the difference in where Memphis Meats falls and where did they go through, IndieBio or FoodX? IndieBio. Got it. So uh, the deeper tech uh, li life science ones that actually have to grow things in bioreactors and do you know genetic uh, engineering work, those would go through IndieBio. Um, the so the the way that it works in terms of breaking out the, the difference is um, number one uh, you have with a, with the case of a, a Memphis Meats uh, that's a cellular agriculture uh, field and most of our companies are cellular agriculture. So the what cellular agriculture. If you were okay, like so, a neophyte like me, how would you? Yeah, no, I understand. So so the uh, Beyond Meats is basically like a veggie burger, really great tasting veggie burgers. I love the company. I love the product. It has a long run ahead of it. It is a really great company, but it's basically soy um, chopped up. Yeah, and it's and it's got all sorts of you know formulations. It's processed vegetables that, that make it take taste like meat, and it's a great product. Um, and the same thing is true with Impossible uh, Foods with their Impossible Burger. They throw in a little bit of genetic uh, engineering work. They have this uh, protein called heme that uh, they. Modif they basically take that from and they produce that to create the blood-like element of uh, of the meat. Uh, I'm not. I, I, I. Those two are both great companies. But cellular agriculture goes beyond beyond 
meat and it's more impossible than the impossible burger. The cellular agriculture work actually starts at the cell and is actually creating, uh, you know, from the original cow uh, stem cell or the fish stem cell or, or the, you know, the chicken, you know, for, for eggs. Um, it's actually finding the proteins that need to be produced in the case of uh, things where you're just taking output uh, from an animal. Like uh, if you look at, uh, if you look at milk uh, without a cow, uh, you're not actually using the cells of the cow, but you're using the output of the cells of the cow. So we then take those genes that produce those casein and whey proteins and the things that are necessary to make milk, and they produce those in bioreactors. There's different kinds. So that's for so that's one type of cellular agriculture. And another type of cellular agriculture is where you're actually harvesting the cells themselves, the, the actual meat, and then you're producing that at large scale. Um, you know, and all and of is the, that done in a bioreactor as well when you take the meat sample yeah. and then make more? It's a different kind of bioreactor, yeah. but yeah. And does so, that require the slaughtering of the animal or taking, I know it's kind of graphic, but uh, taking a sample of a, of a yeah. cow or do you kill one cow and make like a hundred yeah, times yeah. that? Don't have to, no, 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 no animals are harmed in this whole process. No, no animals so you're are You're taking killed. a sample of the meat from a fish and then duplicating it, essentially replicating it. You can take a, even even in your own body, you can create a clone of yourself uh, by just taking a fat cell, right? Right, uh, and and just take that out. It, it, there's no, uh, you don't have to kill any animals, and there's no brain attached uh, to the to the animal as it's pr producing these. Uh, I'm curious, products. what's the has the and this is a total aside, but people like the asides on the podcast. Has the uh, the PETAs of the world, the people who want to protect animals, who uh, feel great empathy for uh, the animals in our factory um, system, have they passed their judgment on the no brain meat cells being replicated in a Petri dish? And if that is cruel and unusual and horrible, where do they stand on all this? Or are they, are they, well, they, they embrace as it as we all are. <laughs> and generally, you know, vegans and other other people that that are in it for the ethical purpose of not slaughtering life in order to uh, to feed ourselves, uh, they embrace this. They they may not some pe some people may not choose to eat that meat, uh, but it is vegan meat because it doesn't actually uh, even though it's the same meat that you would be eating, you know, in a, in a McDonald's hamburger or whatever. Uh, it's it's done without the sacrifice of you uh, of animal life. So um, if no you objected sla based suffering. on the slaughter of animals, you might accept this meat. If you are against eating meat itself for whatever health reasons, then you're still not going to embrace this. But you might not be protesting outside of Memphis Meat's office or yeah, and I think the burger which has some of this. And the other people, obviously, that are affected by this are the climate change people, and they're, of course, hugely a, a fan of this. Like all, all the climate change people should be protesting outside the offices of every meat producer in the in the on the planet. Why and, is the Impossible Burger so much more expensive than a hamburger today? And when will we have the flip of an Impossible Burger, a Memphis Meat Burger, et cetera, being cheaper than the actual real thing? Yeah. So like if you look at the cost of producing these things, uh, it's actually cheaper. That's why the profitability of, I, I think, Beyond Meat is much better than a traditional uh, hamburger uh, manufacturer using the beef uh, process. Um, it, it does. They're charging a premium for it because they can, because uh, because it's the beginning of a marketplace and people like to charge a premium for these things. But the actual cost of goods sold is less because it is cheaper to produce the protein uh from uh vegetables than it is to produce it from cows and it takes much less energy as well to produce one calorie so of wait energy a second. of this makes no sense to me beyond meat burgers i'm just reading here from a bank of america an an analysis is from the washington post said beyond meat burgers are 12 dollars per pound compared to four dollars per pound for ground regular beef patties so that is a 3x difference but what you're saying is they're just price gouging they're just taking a massive margin and it actually is cheaper than beef patties well, I, I think you have software companies that are on your program uh, yeah. occasionally, right? Yeah. So uh, I, I would say that you can charge uh, more than it costs and 
Uh, in the case of software in particular, the cost of goods sold is very low. So you would ar argue, I guess, using that same argument that all software companies are price gouging. And I suppose oh, you'd yeah, be yeah. right. So I, let me put aside that uh, language, which I guess is a little bit biased and leading. But wouldn't the better model be to just be comparable price or cheaper if it is in fact cheaper? Like why take the margin when you could scale? Is it just too hard they, to scale these businesses right now? They are scaling and it does, it's true. It does take hundreds of millions of dollars of plant to, to scale. Ah, so and maybe so that's sort the of, reason. They're sort of saving up and getting profitable in order to make the capital cheap enough so that they can continue to scale uh -huh. at the rate that they've been scaling. So the infrastructure cost has not been built out, but you're saying if theoretically the infrastructure was built out, you'd now be competitive or less expensive. Are the governments engaging with these companies with an eye towards reducing global warming yet? Because it does seem like if you want to affect global warming, you could work on getting people discounts and, and rebates for their Tesla, which I think have mostly been deprecated by now, um, but they did have an impact. Why are the governments not uh, subsidizing this or making it um, otherwise more profitable or helping with the infrastructure in order to reduce global warming. It seems like an easier thing to do, or maybe perhaps the easiest thing in the world to do. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And I think it's coming that way. Uh, but, you know, it's still very early. I mean, these are these industries, like, for example, the Memphis Meats thing, the first burger uh, that they produced at, at Indie Bio in San Francisco, I think it was like $80,000 a pound or something, which was still an improvement <laughs> over the theoretical uh, European experiment, which cost like, Two hundred and forty thousand dollars a pound, but but still, uh, then it was eight. Th it took them a year to get down to eight thousand a pound, and then it was another year to get down to eight hundred. And they're still at you know, I think their 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 goal is to be at eight dollars a pound and in Costco's, and and I'm not sure what the time frame is, but it's pretty it's pretty soon. Yeah, it's um, it's pretty amazing how much this has been embraced. What I want to ask you, because I'm really obsessed with this food. Um, uh, concept is when we get back from this quick break, I want you to explain to me if you believe that world hunger and food is going to be a problem that is solved in our lifetime because of this technology when we get back on the swing of startups. I want to take a moment and tell you about the importance of insurance for your startup. And I am an expert at this because I've been doing it for 30 years. I had a magazine, I had a search engine, I had a blogging company. I have been sent legal letters every year Anybody who's successful in business is going to need insurance because they're going to have things come up. Let me just go through the top four types of insurance with you. Cyber insurance. Imagine you get hacked, your entire customer role, maybe their credit cards if you didn't hash them properly. Uh, maybe it's an inside job and really important stuff gets leaked. You need to have cyber insurance to cover you. There's DNO insurance. That's directors and uh, officers. That's like your top employees, officers. And if you do something stupid, you're going to get sued and you want to make sure that your officers, the top employees of the company, and your directors, people who are on the board, have insurance and they're covered. In fact, people, you can't get great um, directors and you can't get great officers for your company if you don't have this. E and O insurance stands for errors and omissions. Really important to have, especially in editorial and other um, uh, services. And any big customer you have using your product is going to want you to have E and O if you're going to close a deal with them. And then finally, this EPL, Employment Practices Liability, that covers harassment and wrongful termination. And you see these things come up all the time. And listen, you might be the greatest boss in the world, but if somebody else feels like they've been wrong, they're going to sue you. And there's plenty of attorneys out there who want to sue you, especially if you're a venture-backed company. And you might have somebody in your organization. It may not be you. It might be somebody else in your organization does something really stupid and harasses somebody, and then you're on the hook for it. So you want to get that EPL. You want to get that e and You want to get the D&O. And you want to get that cyber insurance. And in brokers technology, is going to get it for you and it's going to save you time and money prices are up to 20 percent lower and you're going to get better coverage you go sign up and get a quote and you purchase within just wait for it 10 minutes so what's your excuse now here's the thing you don't have to call a traditional broker insurance company and deal with large slow incumbents and sign up taking days if not weeks and a process that's just simply not transparent with opaque pricing. They make it quick, they make it easy, and they make it better to instantly buy custom-built insurance for startups. Go to imbroker.com slash twist, imbroker.com slash twist. That's E-M, broker, B-R-O-K-E-R, dot com slash twist. And get an extra 10% off by using the offer code ANGEL10.
All right, you may have never heard of uh, SOSV. Uh, I wasn't super familiar with it. Uh, but producer Nick found Sean O'Sullivan based on all these incredible companies that have come out of his accelerators, uh, which are based in uh, largely in China, the, the, the three well, operators. Well, uh, no, uh, we have we have some in China. Uh, we have our, the the indie bio, uh, we have our indie bio is based in, mostly in the U.S. Right, so okay. San Francisco and now New York. Hacks has an office in uh, San Francisco, but also offices in in Tokyo, mm -hmm. uh, in Shenzhen and Xi'an, uh, China, um, and uh, and so yeah, we're kind of scattered uh, yeah. globally, uh, with good reason. When we went to the break. I'm curious, you know, based on what you know, running an accelerator and looking at food, there's been this big concern of, uh, you know, a bunch of societies, China uh, comes to mind, are now moving to more consumption of uh, meat, specifically cows. Uh, and there's a concern, hey, uh, will we be able to keep up with this? What's it going to do for global warming? How, from where you sit, are, do you think food as an issue in the world Healthy food being available to everybody is going to be solved in our lifetime. Absolutely, of yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I, I, it would have taken if the people in China or India had uh, continued on the path of consuming just as much meat per capita as we do, and everybody kind of likes doing that um, in the West. Um, it would have taken four planet Earths to support uh, the the population of uh, of of the world eating the same level of meat as we do in Europe and in the United States. So uh, we don't have the four planet Earths at the moment. Uh, I keep watching all these science fiction uh, channels. Yeah, we might terraform. We could do some Prometheus. <laughs> that's one option. <laughs> yeah, so that's one option. And Sounds the pretty other costly. Yeah, it's a costly thing. We are, we're actually looking at lots of other things, we're growing algae, in the ocean and we have other projects that are doing that as well okay as i'm gonna put a sources. pin in that one but that we're going back to that one terraforming yeah okay. yeah well that terraforming speaking, but, i know but speaking of terraforming it is yeah. in a way <laughs> yes yes creating yes. It's farms taking advantage. where there were not absolutely absolutely yeah. and that's been going on for a little while here with all these salmon farms and all these ponds and all these other sort of ways that they're harvesting at very different rates than uh, you would have imagined uh, previously or was ever possible previously. But at any rate, um, the in terms of the you know production of this, you can produce uh, you know at least nine times as much uh, using bioreactors rather than you know traditional uh, animal farming, mass animal farming. So we actually can cover these issues even just on that front. And then the other uh, option is I think that plant-based meats are going to continue to to be a very viable option, and they're they're much better for the environment than the, the, um, you know, Let's, the actual um, animal. Let me, let me industry. phrase the question this way as well. So you're really confident we're not going to have any kind of a food shortage or all these food problems will be solved by this technology. I'm in agreement. Um, what 10 years ago, state of the art was that frozen garden burger that tasted horrible. It was exactly. It was remember awful. that the frozen one in the yeah. plastic bag, you buy 10 of them. It was the most disgusting thing you could ever eat. Like literally yep. the bun and the cheese was the best part of the burger in those situations, but people still ate them like sadistic, insane people um, <laughs> would eat those garden burgers. It felt so bad for them. Um, and now we have bloody impossible burgers and Memphis meats and beyond meats that if you do it side by side, I think half the people would get fooled. You know, if you, if they weren't expecting it, you, you could literally swap it out 10 years yep. from now and 20 years from now, what is the bull case on what those products forget about society and pete and all that for a second the taste what a gourmand a foodie is going to experience with those products what would those products look like in 10 to 20 years well it's very very funny because you can actually engineer you know a much better product uh once you start engineering it it's just like if you were uh, to for example have a tree fall across a river and uh you know say okay uh, uh, that's a good bridge or if you could engineer a bridge across a river, you know, with concrete and steel and things, you know, actually you can produce better products by engineering it a little bit. So we found, uh, for example, even with Clara Foods, which is the one, the company that produces all these egg whites without chickens, uh, that you What's can What's the name produce. of that company? Clara Foods. Clara uh, Foods, Clara, yeah. That's C -L -A. in market? Uh, they are selling to, as an ingredient supplier to, um, 
to uh, yeah, I remember them. Uh, producers. Yeah. So uh, they, they are, um, you know, so they're an ingredients company and we have a, a number of other companies, gel tour, which produces human collagen instead of, uh, you know, using the collagen and, uh, and jello, uh, you know, gelatin uh, style uh, products from animals. There's a number of other uh, technologies. Wait, wait, where does the gelatin come from? Well, gelatin is actually just cooked uh, yeah. collagen. I don't know if you knew that or not. Yeah, but, no, I did. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, gelatin is traditionally from like animal bones, right? Right. Uh, you know, so. Uh, and now and there's so, a company making that based on what? Based off of just, you know, producing it in bioreactors. Bi bioreactors. So anything. But any, anything that can be produced by uh, the human body or animal bodies or by nature, plants, uh, can in fact- Are they be producing it from human uh, gelatin then or animal gelatin? Um, for human collagen, human collagen. You, want human, you want human collagen if you're going to be doing that for makeup and things right. like that. So previously uh, or, that would be cannibalism. We didn't actually have that in the world. No, you did not harvest people for that. No, we did not. No, I mean, I'm just pausing for a second to even consider <laughs> how amazing and outlandish this is right now. You, there are things you cannot eat a human. We've ne would never consider that cannibalism is <laughs> kind of out of favor. But in this situation, you could actually take collagen from humans and manufacture it, and we could actually have the good stuff that we actually need. This is not the first time this has been done. Oh, if really? you look back, to, if you if you look back to the 1980s, my mom is a diabetic, was a diabetic. Yeah. She's passed away. But and oh yeah, and I know where you're going with this. Yeah, yeah. Before you know, with insulin, it, it was coming out of pigs and cows, and it would get infected, and you know, and there, people would die from using it. It'd be put in nice little bottles on the shelf, but it was really just coming out of slaughterhouses, um, and you know, for harvesting the harvesting the insulin from from the from from the animals. So what instead, uh, you know, what Gen um, Genentech did is they created, uh, you know, a bioreactor. It cost them hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars to do that back in the day. And they, within a few years, they completely replaced the entire insulin market from animals. And that's exactly what's going to happen in all of these other industries as well. Wow. It's just going to it's just going to take. And a so the quality time. of the synthetics goes way up because they're much easier to control in terms of food supply. You don't have um, the ability of bacteria. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you look at what happens in a cow, I mean, yeah, there's no, a certain there's a certain amount of feces that are allowed yeah. in you know the the fecal matter that's allowed when this cow is ground up and up to that amount it's okay and they can just sell it but yeah. the problem with all that fecal matter and all that bacteria it, that's in that fecal matter is that that's why meat goes bad so quickly you know, and that's why people out. get sick from meat you know people that's why that exactly death so it, from it yeah if you grow it in a lab and you don't require the bacteria to be there then you're in great shape so in 10 to no. 20 years you're saying it's going to be massively safer, but what is a holy grail of a product that you think you'll see come into the accelerator that previously has not been able to be made? So we're, you know, everybody's obsessed with burgers and maybe some, you know, General Tso's chicken. Uh, yeah, you know, pretty easy to to fake the Beyond Meat chicken when you're breading it and putting sugar sauce on it, right? <laughs> kind of takes <laughs> over. But tell me, what's what are the holy grails of meat production? Because a burger also ground up, you're getting a little bit of mulligan there because it's a ground up thing. You got a lot of cheese, you got a lot of burger, sauces, et cetera. Yeah, I think it goes beyond, I think it goes beyond what just replacements for our existing food supply. I think it yeah. goes into designing new, new food. Really? Yeah, I mean, even the stuff that uh, Clara Foods is doing is they're creating much richer sort of, uh, you know, what's that cream that you get when you whip an egg, um, you know? Oh, uh, anyway. you're, yeah, you're talking when you make the peaks, um, yeah. meringue and stuff like that. Oh, yeah, yeah meringue. They, they make some unbelievably great meringue. And you can have fluffier milk than you could ever have before. You know, you can have Swear. richer, fattier milk if you wanted. So like these are things that that artisan consumers of or artisan manufacturers of products are going to look to to produce, you know, finer and better products in the future. But but beyond that, I mean, we're looking at the next generation, right? So we're we're looking. What's at the craziest thing you've seen? What was the craziest well, pitch? So whether you funded it or not, you well, can obscure yeah, the name no, of well, it, but one that was no, really far out there, maybe even unfundable in your mind. We no, we fund things that are completely crazy every couple of You fund things that month. are unfundable is what you're about to say, Sean. <laughs> we fund the unfundable <laughs> Absolutely. things. Absolutely. We well, did. It's kind I of mean, my I, business I, too. It's like we're funding things that other people consider unfundable. 
what we what we do, yeah, exactly right at the so, time. Uh, yeah. Our our motto at SOSV is is making the impossible inevitable, right? Yeah. So just taking something which would have been thought as totally crazy and making it absolutely a necessity for society. So what what I, I'll give you one example in a non uh, meat way is just uh, you know creating you know how you have people who take the blood out of a human and then give it to another human, uh, blood banks and things like that. Uh, you yeah, know, blood, blood boys. I think there was yeah. a whole Silicon Valley oh, yeah. <laughs> theme of blood boys. Yes, we get it. Transfusing blood is, there, there, there's this concept that if you get blood transfusions, this could be an incredibly right. accretive thing for people who are dying and decaying if young people give yeah. them their blood. Yeah, so we just had a company, Membio, that just graduated and received several million dollars. That's just producing those without actually requiring a human to do. No to blood do boy it. necessary. No so blood boy necessary. But no, I mean, this is mostly boy. for surgery, right? This is mo mostly for actual medical use, right? Yeah. So th this is uh, valid use. It's not for the yeah, uh, you know, the rich billionaires of the world. Yeah. Uh, for me, I I'm going to know that you're doing your job when you can get me some Peking duck that rivals the Peking duck at like Ma 32 in Hong Kong or Hakkasan here in San Francisco. Like if you can get that level of Peking duck, how far before somebody can make a crispy skin Peking duck, like multi-layered texture meat like that? Is that 10, mm -hmm. 20 years out? What do you think? I think it could be. You know, I think the first of, the, of this is going to be more the commodity replacement, right? Uh, the 99% of the market or the 95% of the market that people- oh, so boring. Uh, you know, I'm waiting for the wild goo. Yeah, yeah. I think there'll be there'll be some people that'll be going up for that artisan stuff. I mean, we have people that make you know cheeses, right? So, so those are those are uh, going to the next level. So are any of those cheeses good? I, you know, I had this Daya cheese, didn't like it. No, because We'd you know rather what? have the, no cheese. Yeah, well, no, and listen, I love cheese because if they can't replicate the the the, the whey proteins and the uh, casein proteins they're they're not going to get that stretchiness that yes. that a milk based cheese has yeah. right so and we have companies that have figured all that out right so so they're working on the next generation of cheeses and they are you know they're in the they're getting in the market so right. we're always a few years ahead incredible of you know i always when i get the omelet they say you want cheese of course i want cheese and i go for the cheddar blue cheese combo but I was mm. just thinking out loud here, man, somebody's going to make, instead of mixing cheddar and blue cheese, they're going to make that into one thing. We're going to make these hybrid designer cheeses that are going to be bonkers. Yeah. And that's what the I'm looking forward misses. to. I'm not in this for like saving money and feeding the world. Like I know that's going to get done for me. It's like, okay, great. Noble. You're going to get it done. It's kind of like a checkbox for me. That's a natural thing that occurs. But I'm looking for one of these companies to make me a Kobe, Kobe, Wagyu, Miyazaki that's better than what I'm getting yeah. right now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I I'm glad I'm glad for you. I'm, uh, show I'm me the O Toro bit... that beats O Toro. That's what I want. Okay. Well, I'm I'm less of a foodie. I think we are we have to address our food supplies uh in terms of the health of our food supply and in terms of what it's doing to our population. Yeah, that's true. Uh, yeah. You know, I know you're so gonna get that done. Yeah. We're working on that stuff. We're working on making sure that the world has a supply, uh, you know, and uh, and that the climate change issues are dealt with at the same time. I, this is another silly one, but um, I'm curious if in the ingredient space, you've seen people working on ingredients that would take an ingredient that was typically causing obesity and not only not have it cause obesity, like obviously we've had sugar substitutes and stevia and saccharin yep. and all this other stuff, but- what if there were things that were traditionally harmful that could not only be neutralized, but could become healthy? So as a yeah. thought experiment, a donut or a slice of pizza that was as good as eating a salad. Are there people working on ingredients that could have that level of promise? Be and I'm asking for a yep. friend, obviously. <laughs> you want to eat your donuts and get and, and get I mean, thin I just at the love same time. A, a good bear claw. You know, you ever a bear claw? It's like oh, one and a half donuts. Geez, I know. Put it. some. It's really great. Apple you know? stuff in the apple middle. Apple fritter. It's, you know, it's apple. Yeah. I don't even, and I technically don't know the difference between an apple fritter and a bear claw because I point to the same thing, and some people call them different things. But <laughs> you know, like the one and yeah. a half size donuts. When are those going to be healthy for you? Do you see that the ingredients that are shifting to be anti-diabetic because that is a huge risk factor right now. Yeah, on the ingredient level, there are a number of things that are being done. Uh, we have a, a you know a company that has replaced the 
you know, that actually has a, uh, a protein that locks into the tongue receptors. And then everything uh, that you taste at, at that point and afterward uh, is just immediately rich and sugary and really sensual. Uh, you know, so it's a it's something that came from some coffee bean or something in Kenya. It is a natural uh, thing, but it just needs to be manufactured and made stable and self self stable. So we have a company that's working on that uh, technology. So wait, wait, it primes your tongue and your palate to make what comes next richer tasting. Well, now you just put it talking. in. You, you just put it in with the food and you can t take us, you know, how those, those kombuchas and things like that. A lot of yeah. people don't like them because, you know, they, they taste like uh, sour. They taste like the butt Yeah, bad. they taste yeah. sour or they taste bad or whatever. Yeah, you just put a little vinegar this, with a little fruit in it. Yeah. Yeah. You t put a little of this stuff in there and it's the richest, most satisfying thing. It makes terrible stuff taste great. You know, um, I think it'll be useful for medicines as well. But the, the, the thing that you were asking about, I think that is also relevant is if, can you take stuff that will absorb the other sugars uh, and the other things that are in our diet? And we had a, a company out of the last batch. I'm sorry. I'm not remembering all the names of my Greek companies. That's but, okay. Uh, I, I have that same know, experience that occurs. You have too many. It's, it's terrible. It's like yeah. not for, it's like not remembering one of your kids' names. It's like, hey, here's I, Susan, here's Bobby, and the I know. third one. Yeah. But but like we're we're basically this product actually puts uh you know you know it's a fiber that is put into uh, the food um and then it will it will effectively uh, lodge you know it comes through your gut and it yeah. sort of soaks up all the sugar as that fiber sort of ah. expands and soaks up all the sugar and pulls it through. So what you are, you know, it, it drags out the sort of the bad uh, wow. know, carbohydrates from your from your body as it's going through. So basically you can imagine there being an ice cream that you eat and it's incredibly sweet and delicious, has real sugar in it, but it's mitigated as a mitigation ingredient that then processes the sugar without adding fat to your body. Well, yeah, I, I think you can do that in two ways. You, the ice cream doesn't need to have that sh that kind of sugar anyway. Sure. But but the idea is that the ice cream you could eat that ice cream, and then it could also clean up all the excess carbohydrates and sugar from your the meal that you just ingested. So uh, literally, that. I eat I just pound a pepperoni pizza, <laughs> and then I hit it with a Haagen Dazs washer to to <laughs> counter it. I mean, this is I have been spending my life on the wrong things. Clearly. Thank the Lord that you're out there doing God's work. Yeah, well, thank you. I mean, we 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 at SOSV, you know, we're very much focused on hardware, physical issues, these kinds of issues. Yeah, hard. And the science-based uh, stuff, uh, you know, that uh, is less, uh, you know, I mean, certainly like the hardware, for example, all these sensing devices and whatnot, they all have AI built into them because sensors are naturally you know, made for AI effectively with the huge data streams that they produce that machine learning is geared towards optimizing. I, so it looks like the Atlantic is calling this miracle, uh, this miracle, miracle berry, miraculin. Mira, miralex, miralex, uh, miraculex is the name of the miraculex company. Miraculex is the name of the company, Mirac yeah. And miraculin um, is the name of the protein. Miraculin is the name of the protein. And it comes from yep. that berry. Thank you for, uh, you must have had a researcher who, who's- Yeah, I got researchers up. live. I, you know what I do is I just pretend sometimes during the show that I'm like, oh yeah, I just remembered. Uh, yeah, it's this. <laughs> and then people are like, wow, Jason's got an encyclopedic knowledge. And literally I've got two producers dropping <laughs> shit into the Slack room while I'm doing the show. And the, But sometimes the guests get thrown off. They're like, wow, you, Jake, how really deep knowledge base across so many topics. Uh, I yeah. didn't do that this time. I should have. Um, who's funding all this? Who are your LPs? And when you have your demo day or people graduate, are you bringing them to Chinese investors, American investors? Yeah, yeah. And, and how does that work? Well, you know, like our LPs are actually just uh, American uh, LPs. So we have, uh, you know, 700 million uh, assets under management. We have 277 was the fund that just closed in December. Uh, and these are American ago. LPs, you said? I mean, it's mostly Americans, yeah. some Japanese, some... I mean, there's a, a tiny fraction of Chinese ones. We yeah. really haven't uh, tapped the Chinese market uh, so much. Maybe, I don't know, uh, I don't know, 2% or something like that. Pretty mm -hmm. immaterial, 3% um, uh, of Chinese investors. Uh, the Japanese are more progressive on, on a lot of these issues. But I'd say, the and there's some Europeans, probably 10 or 15% European uh, family offices and institutions. How is doing business in China and running the accelerator in China different than running it in San Francisco. You know, there's uh, 
less that we don't understand i think here in the us how china is has a free market but is not a democracy it's something mm-hmm. else mm-hmm. so how does china work in having this ca- allowing capitalism while not being a democracy and then how do they look at an american coming in there and running an accelerator and you've been there for a while so how has that changed since i don't know the 12 years or so you've been running an accelerator in shenzhen and other places in china shenzhen. yeah 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 we started in dalian and now we're in shanghai dalian is that other place Dalian. Uh, Dalian, uh, I'm pronouncing correctly. Mean big, uh, I forget what Lian means. But anyway, so uh, yeah, it's uh, it's up in the north. It's kind of near North Korea. It's, uh, Factory that, that town? Uh, it is more of an IT town. It's kind of like the Bangalore uh, of-, of uh, Oh, IT, of, like information technology. Got it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, they're, they're, they, there's 500, all the Fortune 500 companies have hundreds of locations there that they do their outsourcing. In China, Dalian has been sort of like the Bangalore of China. Um, but but it, and and of Japan uh, as well. A lot of the Japanese uh, businesses go to Dalian, and Russian businesses as well. But we started there. But we we're now in uh, Shanghai and Shenzhen. Um, did they Shenzhen invite you the there, or did you just show up and say, "Hey, I'm here. I want to build an accelerator"? Because I know they were courting business over the last twenty years, trying to get American companies to set up shop. I'm assuming they courted you. No, uh, I I went there uh, because I was uh, I was running a different company at the time. Uh, that was doing ride sharing and things like that. Um, and th- that we set up an operation, a division of our company in, in China, in Dalian. And then when I was in Dalian, I decided at that point, I was also uh, one of the LPs behind Techstars. Uh, when Techstars expanded from Boulder to Boston, I, I, I was it. one of the founding LPs in Techstars. And I thought, you know what? Like This would be really great to do something in a completely different marketplace with a completely different software marketplace. Because, of course, behind the great firewall, it's a completely different uh, way that software works in China. Um, and uh, so we started China Accelerator uh, in, in Dalian originally. And then when we had some hardware companies applying to China Accelerator, because there's a lot of hardware in China, we said, well, it doesn't make any sense to have a hardware accelerator and a software accelerator in the same thing, because there's totally different industries, totally different investors totally different everything so uh we specialize you know we specialized by going to shenzhen for the hardware accelerator which we called hacks we did that in 2012 uh and then uh we moved the the uh, software and so how is doing business there different I'm curious if at all so well um it is um it's pretty it's pretty open. It's not as bad as you think. You can't do it. Like if you have a company, there's certain industries you can't sell into because, you know, media, you can't do anything in uh, sort of public uh, space. Obviously, if you have anything like a search engine, they'll shut you down. You know, yeah. they like to control all the information. So Google had had no chance of ever being successful in, in China. And fa- frankly, Facebook uh, has has challenges uh you know, and the, Facebook challenge. doesn't operate there at all. I mean, Zuckerberg's been yeah. desperately trying to convince them to let him in. And they yeah. see what's happening with Facebook around the world. And they're like, yeah, no, that we do yeah. not want to hand you any influence. Sorry, Zuckerberg. Right. In yeah, that way, no. you have to respect the Chinese. I, I mean, honestly, like you're <laughs> looking at what the, inf- the oversized influence Zuckerberg has here. And they're just like, yeah, no, absolutely yeah, I mean, not. If you think about Google and Facebook, I mean, they are about sort of access to information or sharing information amongst people, and China needs to control all that. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, from their point of view as a dictator, not a dictatorship, but what do you call it? Uh, authoritarian. Oligarchy? Authoritarian. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. So, um, so, uh, but the, uh, so if you are selling to the Chinese government, that's where you'll hit sort of uh, bad issues, like corruption issues and things like that. But the, the, if you're not, uh, then you don't have to worry about it. Mm. Uh, uh, you know, you, the businesses are free to operate uh, pretty pretty well. You just need to have enough Chinese speaking uh, staff or people. You know, the partners. We have a couple of partners that speak Chinese uh, at SOSV, and that helps as well. Uh, let's talk, Sean, about hardware. In America, mm-hmm. I send a hardware company to a VC. They say we don't do hardware. Hardware too hard. You're right. We've embraced hardware. Um, yeah. Or just, why like do the hardware. VCs here hate hardware so much? And then why do you love it so much that you would start an accelerator? Are you a masochist or are you just... Yeah, yeah no, I, like in the old days, hardware was, 
even harder than it is today. Now there's so many frameworks and the, the cost has come down uh, so much. Um, it used to, the, I think what, the reason why Silicon Valley VCs stopped backing hardware companies is that every hardware company would cost them, you know, $70 million to spin up, hmm. you know, um, and, and in our case, we're spinning up hardware companies, you know, getting some non-dilutive revenue from a million dollar or three or $4 million Kickstarter projects uh, in the consumer companies. And they're able to get running and financed for, you know, in the, in the small millions, if even that, you know, sometimes we have companies that are getting to be break even profitable with just one or two million in, in capital. Normally hardware costs a lot more and it takes yeah. a little bit longer time, but with the kind of, you know, people pay for hardware and they don't have a problem paying for hardware. Yeah, they love paying uh, for hardware. Yeah. The problem is the so, race to the bottom. So how do you mitigate against that race to the bottom? You know, somebody comes out with well, AirPods. Yeah. There's so many competitors to AirPods. Now you can buy $30 AirPods or somebody comes out with. Yeah. Something. So I think it, it it's it, when you design your hardware, you have to build a community around it and you have to build the web services into your hardware. And that's where the benefit uh, comes. So like if you're looking at, um, you know, a hardware uh, device that, for example, um, you know, can improve your tennis or, or something like that, you know, yeah. where, where it's feeding you back. I mean, there's a lot of the, the software and the updates and the the letting your friends know that, you know, how much you've played today or, or whatever, when you're when you're hitting that intelligent tennis racket around. Those are things that are um, those are things that are interesting to people who play tennis. And for those people that are interested in in, you know, sharing their, you know, competing you know, with some other connected services like running or anything else, you have hardware that appeals to those markets. Where it comes in for, you know, industry is when you have internet connected devices that are measuring, you know, uh, you know, patients uh, vital data so that they can uh, discover oh, that this set of conditions in the metabolites in the blood leads to cancer of this type or leads to, uh, you know, some other metabolic uh, problem of, it, of another type. And so when the hardware is actually uh, serving as a connected service, then the value of the hardware is, is, is massive. So it has to be software and hardware together by, you know, in, in a new form factor. And then, then the value to the customer is huge. And uh, when you look at um, the relationship- The copyability- let me let me oh, yeah. let me just suggest there, there's an issue with going to China and having everyone copy your hardware um, yeah. because that has happened right sure. and that happens and actually that even happens in the United States but the the way that you thrive as a hardware company is building a value proposition that uh, that says okay we we're going to actually build in the the web services and the software you know the community as part of this hardware and when you yeah do I mean that, if you look at Fitbit the Fitbit community and software is so good. I still wear a Fitbit to this day because I like competing with my friends, and, and you know, it's I could get, I could get any kind of like generic pedometer or whatever they call them, and you know, ha pay five bucks for it or ten bucks for it. But I, I want the hundred fifty dollar Fitbit that they break too often. But um, yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a, a bit of a problem. Um, what do you think of this new trend? Has hardware as a service? You have companies charging. For SaaS software, it kind of relates to this. We have one called Density. Um, that's hardware as a service. They have a hardware device, but they're really charging for the software. They do people counting uh, in spaces privately with uh, privacy, um, without like video cameras uh, on people. So yep. what do you think of that trend? Is that a real trend? Very real trend. It's a massive, massive benefit to people and they like paying for for that way. We even have one of our companies is the Neura, uh, the spectacular headphones that were personalized to your personal ear drums. Ah. Um, I don't know if you've heard I've of I've heard them of or, it. You you basically yeah. take a mold and send it to them and they make you. No, you just put on their headphones. They have inner sensors that, that, that send out signals at various frequencies. What? Um, and then, yeah. And then, uh, then it will listen to the way that your ear sends these silent responses through like the I forget what it's called. Um, I'm totally messing this up, but the, yeah, yeah. Like the cilia of your ear canal. Yeah. And they send like these microscopic sort of messages that it listens for. And then it fine tunes your hearing, uh, wow. you know, personalizes the hearing of the left and right ear are different. And that's why like you get people like Stevie Wonder who, you know, once he tried these on, he was like, oh my God, he went out and bought three, went down to Santa Monica Apple store and bought like three. What's of the name things. of it? 
Uh, neurophones. Neuro. Neurophones. I got to get those. Yeah. N U R A. Um, yeah. They're spectacular. I, I promised I would uh, hit the terraforming. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but anyway, yeah. so, but when you look at that, like, you know, that responds to the question, what, I, I forget, I, what was the question? Well, uh, no, we were, we were talking about hardware as a service and def oh, yeah, defensible yeah. in general. And it's super defensible yeah. if you wear these headphones and it makes this profile. Heck, you, you know, if, if I could have that same profile put into my AirPods, I would pay whatever it is, 50 bucks a year to just have the profile tweaked in real time. Yeah. Well, Neura actually sells now even on a per monthly basis, right? Wow. Whatever it is, six, six or seven dollars a month or eight, eight or nine bucks a month, depending on what the headphones are. Um, wow. And it, yeah, and it makes total that, sense. That's just a different way of selling, but it make, it's comfortable for the consumer. So and it's what, uh, what you're doing with the Apple phones anyway. Like, I don't know. Some people are buying Apple phones on a monthly basis and they just always have the Apple phone. Yeah, that's, you know, I mean, people love the idea. I mean, layaway plans, subscription service has always been a really great way for people to lower their upfront cost and uh, become addicted and just pay as they go. And I think, App yeah, Apple has something where you get a new phone every two years or every year, yeah, like 50 that kind bucks of thing. a month or something. And that's exactly like, the thing. Yeah. They're just like, we, we know, let, let's just stop this farce of like, you know, we're releasing new ones and doing a big keynote and getting you excited. Like you're going to want a new one every 12 or 24 or 36 months. It's sort of like a car lease. Like either you love cars yeah. or you want to get value and you're going to pick how long you want to have the the uh, old one. Um, but tell me a little bit about this uh, terraforming in this micro terraforming of people doing algae. I I've heard about this before. People creating new ways to go vertical in farming, people doing algae. Uh, people doing this kind of stuff in oceans, doing it in lakes. What, what's the state of yeah. that there, and why is it important? Well, uh, there, you know, we have companies that are doing, uh, you know, that are doing basically like uh, what do you call it? Containers uh, that are filled with um, shipping containers, you know, shipping container like things, but open so you can receive sunlight. That are then, um, you know, basically using the sunlight uh, to grow al algae and little microscopic plankton and things like that, which then feed fish in another one of the tanks, which wow. then go on to, you know, re recycle. It's like this, it's a, this in internal system that just uses sunlight uh, to grow the biology, which then is used to produce the output fish, um, all without requiring any other inputs. You have wow. other companies that are just basically using uh, like the swamp lands that are uh, estuaries so that they have too much salt so you can't actually grow farm crops on them. Yeah. And, and they're just uh, modifying the, the seeds uh, so that they can actually grow, um, the plants can grow in salt water. Brackish, and so you, probably even, yeah, like half, what do they call it, brackish? Yes, brackish like half salt, yeah. half fresh. Yeah, and then other, the, uh, another approach is to just have these like big sort of circular, semi-circular, um, you know, uh, things in ponds or bays um, where inside that uh, you're you're growing and harvesting uh, the the algae as a as a product uh, for generating protein. Amazing! So we can literally just in a pond create a bucket, yeah, and in the mm -hmm. bucket we can create a bunch of protein. Yeah, uh, yeah. There's 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 a lot of wonderful work that's uh, happening right now. And there's a lot of people investing in this space. I mean, we invest uh, 65 million or, or a year or so into the companies that are going through our accelerator programs. Maybe it's a little bit more than that. Um, and then, and then other investors invest between 500 million to a billion dollars a year. Uh, they're, they're coming a little later into the same companies uh, that that uh, came out of the accelerator. So it's, and it's really tell me about yeah. Jump Bike. You had Jump Bike go through the program. Oh, yeah, Jump. Uh, well, actually, Jump was a hardware investment that we made even before Hacks was around. Um, and so it didn't go through the program officially, but we, we've we uh, helped, you know, we've helped with them over the years in a number of ways, both on the hardware side and on the business side. So we were uh, a lead investor in them for the first five years, the lead investor in them for the first five years of their operations. Yeah, it seems to me like that's going to be a great adjunct to the Uber business, the Lyft business of just making mm -hmm. it a subscription. I don't know why people are even paying for that on like a usage basis. Why is that not a subscription where you just, you pay in 30 be. bucks a month, you can use the scooter unlimited, you know, or well, up they, to they, X number they, of miles. 
I think they've been a little bit smarter about how they're doing it because you don't, you know, you don't want to give someone unlimited. You say up to X number of miles. That's fair enough. Yeah, you don't want but people. Like, you know how these kids are. These millennials and Gen Z are going to share the account like they do with their Netflix. But exactly. you just said yeah, thirty yeah. bucks a month for thirty miles. You yeah, have to think about what, it. What they're doing already is they're saying, okay, this is your commute, right? Between yeah. I don't know, Palos Verdes and wherever else yeah um and and uh and then so for this commute if you subscribe this is what your set fee is and they are wow. doing that already i think with some some in some geographies oh that's that pretty cool sense. yeah so you're yeah. just like hey here's what you would pay on mass transit we'll just buy that and you're you're all set for the month yeah it's like your monthly rail pass kind of thing if you're on the east coast so smart all right listen yeah. continued success thanks for spending the hour with us and yeah. uh Pr yeah send me some good companies you. and let's get on that uh that Peking duck, okay? Yeah. Let me know when you find we'll that company. It. They're going to show up, I'm sure. At some point when the Peking right. duck or the ice cream that negates the pizza, I'm that, I'm, I have a personal vested interest in investing in those. So let me know. All right. All okay. right. Continue success pleasure. and stay safe. We'll see you all on this week. Sorry, next time. Bye-bye.